the city of festivals, the Big Easy, the city of mystery, Paris of the South, Crescent City. Few places have as many names as New Orleans, the famously diverse cultural melting pot nestled on the bend of the Mississippi River in Louisiana. And few places have ever experienced the all-encompassing fear that hung over the city with the oppressive darkness of a moonless night during the reign of terror of the phantom killer known only as the Axeman. A killer who was so light on his feet that nobody could hear him coming. A killer who could chisel out the panel of a door without waking a soul inside and a killer who never brought his own weapons, but stole the hatchets and axes he used from his victims' own homes. Many people say there's no place on earth like New Orleans, but at the height of the Axeman's rule, there were those who believed the spectral killer targeting Italian grocers in the city was not of this earth at all. Hello and welcome to this episode of Prasher's Murder Map. Today we're visiting the bustling city of New Orleans, which has a rich and vibrant past that makes it a fascinating yet surprising setting for a string of mysterious murders which go down as some of America's strangest. To understand the colourful culture and heritage of New Orleans, we need to take a quick trip through history. France had several holdings in North America in the 1700s, but after their defeat by the British in the Seven Years' War, the French government was forced to give them up, and one of these territories was Louisiana. From 1763, Spain took control of the region before Napoleon retook it in 1802 and sold it to the United States a year later. By now, the US was expanding rapidly, and the port of New Orleans was a welcome addition. 100 miles up the Mississippi River, the port was a hub of trade and opportunity, encouraging mass migration to the city. Hundreds of thousands of immigrants passed through Louisiana and on to other parts of the country, but plenty decided to settle in New Orleans. One of the largest groups of migrants were from the Italian island of Sicily. Back home, Things weren't going so well, and 19th century Sicily was a dangerous place with the highest murder rate in Europe. Families struggled with poverty and the government was ineffective, which led to a rise in protection rackets and blackmail. These sorts of criminals were called mafiosos and were a forerunner of the more organised mafia that still exists today. It was because of this that many Sicilians decided to cross the Atlantic for a better life, although many mafiosos had the same idea and arrived on American shores too. When the Sicilians came, they set up businesses like cobbler shops, restaurants, barbers and groceries, while others worked hard in cotton and sugarcane fields where jobs had become vacant after African Americans from the South began migrating northwards towards urban areas. Italians liked New Orleans because of its European influences from its time under the Catholic French and Spanish. The city became, and still is, a unique fusion of multiple nations and was home to Germans, Italians, Chinese, Mexican and Irish settlers. Despite the city's diversity, There was a lot of anti-Italian sentiment, and people believed they were largely criminals who belonged to the Black Hand, a group of gangsters who ran violent money rackets. At the time, the media used the terms Black Hand and Mafia interchangeably, but there's little evidence that Black Hand society existed in the area, although crime and extortion committed by individuals was rife. 
In the early 1900s, there was a spate of handwritten notes demanding money. They usually read something like this, with an incongruously polite beginning, finishing with a thinly veiled threat. Dear friend, pardon us that we're going to bother you because we are in need, and we ask you to favor us with $200. Be careful and do what we ask you. Otherwise, you might suffer the consequences. Some signed off their notes with a drawing of a black hand to make their victim believe they were part of the notorious criminal gang. The New Orleans police lacked the resources of other forces in wealthier parts of the US, so they relied on informants and beating confessions out of suspects. And there was corruption within their own police department. When a New Orleans police chief was killed in 1890, they arrested 19 Italian men without evidence and put them on trial for murder. When the jury looked set to reach a not guilty verdict, a mob stormed the prison and murdered 11 of the 19. It wasn't just murders and extortion that polluted New Orleans. A curious array of apparitions and bogeymen were said to lurk round every corner and strange and troubling stories could be found in every newspaper. If the media was to be believed, there were strange men dressed in robes hiding in trees, ready to leap down and chase women across the city. There was Jack the Clipper, who crept up behind schoolgirls on streetcars and cut their hair with scissors. And there were black bottle men and needle men, who would forcibly inject passing strangers with a lethal poison at a moment's notice. So phantoms and monsters were nothing new in the psyche of the Orleanians, but nothing could prepare them for the wave of brutality that arrived in 1910 to stain the streets with blood. It was 3am on Saturday 13th of August. 29-year-old Harriet Crutey was startled awake from a dream and found herself in a nightmare. A shadowy figure loomed over her bed holding a meat cleaver, gruffly demanding money. Who's there? Give me your money, or you'll get the same as your husband. Harriet glanced to her side at her 40-year-old husband, August, and gasped as she saw that he was covered in blood. You've murdered him! With shaking hands, she reached under her pillow where she had put eight dollars for safekeeping. In those days, a large sum of money. Is that all you've got? I want all of it! Yes, it's all I have. Just take it! The intruder strode out of the house, stopping to pick up the cage in which the couple's pet mockingbird lived. He had been barefoot when he entered the house, but he paused on his way out to put his shoes back on in the yard and drop the meat cleaver before climbing over the fence with the birdcage tucked under his arm and calmly walked away. A neighbour looking out of his window saw him sit down on a doorstep and open the cage to free the mockingbird before continuing on his way. August Crutey was taken to the charity hospital while police examined the crime scene. Like many Italians in the area, the Crutis ran a grocery store and lived in small rooms at the back, with the store at the front of the building. Harriet thought the attacker was between 35 and 40, about 5 foot 6, broad-shouldered, with dark hair, dark trousers, a black derby hat and a blue workman's shirt. The method of entry was an unusual one, and would become a recurring sinister motif over the following years. The cleaver, as the media quickly named him, had removed a pane of glass from the Crutie's kitchen door and reached in to unlatch the bolt from the inside. He had stolen the cleaver from a butcher's stall a few blocks away earlier that evening. August survived the attack, but remembered little about it, and remarkably, the mockingbird found its way home. Future attacks, however, would not end so happily. A month later, on 20th of September 1910, the cleaver returned. 
It was 1.45 a.m. and Joseph and Conchetta Rosetto were in bed at the back of the grocery they ran on the corner of Tonti Street and London Avenue. The Rosettos in their sleepy state had no idea what had hit them. This time, the man didn't have to remove a pane from their door as a kitchen window was open. He climbed inside holding a meat axe, then used a knife to slice through the mosquito netting surrounding the Rosetto's bed. Relishing the thrill of breaking into their home and wielding the power of life and death over them as they slept, he swung the axe down on Conchetta twice, smashing her cheekbone and leaving deep lacerations in her face and neck. He then struck Joseph twice before dropping his weapon and slipping out of the house through the back door, taking nothing with him except the secret of his identity. Clinging on to life, Joseph fumbled for the pistol he kept in the dresser. Staggering outside, he fired two shots into the air and his neighbours rushed to find out what was going on. The scene was ghastly, the bed and floor covered with blood and clumps of matted hair. The police were perplexed as nothing had been stolen, even though there was $23 in the cash register and several hundred more in the safe. Joseph's gold watch and chain remained untouched. They traced the axe to a butcher's store in a local market. Once again the killer had stolen his weapon and then abandoned it after it had done its vengeful work. Footprints in the dirt outside suggested that the attacker had been barefoot. Both Joseph and Conchetta survived that night, but Joseph died the following year, perhaps because of the lasting effects of the injuries, having been blinded in one eye and badly scarred. Conchetta was paralysed on one side of her face, but lived until 1940. It was around this time that the newspapers gave the attacker the appellation Jack the Axeman and drew parallels with the Jack the Ripper murders in London just 30 years before. Others maintained that the Black Hand were responsible but Detective John D'Antonio believed that no mafioso would have failed to kill and left Crutti and Rosetto alive. Also, neither were from Sicily, and they associated mainly with Americans, not immigrant Italians. Blackhanders would have also been more likely to use a gun or a knife, not a cumbersome weapon like an axe. Nine months later, on Tuesday 27th of June, 1911... 16-year-old Mary Davy suddenly awoke in the middle of the night to a startling noise. She opened her eyes and saw a man standing near the wardrobe. Petrified, she tried to wake her husband, 26-year-old Italian grocer Joe Davy, but he simply moaned. In the dark, Mary couldn't see the horrifying results of the bloodbath that had already taken place. The attacker had hit Joe several times with a meat cleaver, shattering his skull. The sheets were sprayed with brain tissue and skull fragments, and the mosquito netting was torn to shreds and splattered with blood. The man standing silhouetted in the darkness barked at the terrified young woman. Where is your money? She was too frightened to reply and the intruder hit her over the head with a ceramic mug. But he didn't steal a penny from the Davy home. He either didn't find the $60 hidden under Mary's pillow or he wasn't interested, even though he said he was. Was he really a burglar intent on stealing valuables or was there more to his murderous nightly junkets? Mary survived, but Joe died of his injuries. Everything went quiet after the attack on the Davies and the startling headlines about the man known only as the Cleaver slowly faded from public consciousness. It was another six years before he struck again and this time the attacks were more cunning, more bloody and ultimately more fatal. The night of 22nd of December 1917 was cold, dark and moonless. At 3am, 16-year-old Mary Andalina jumped out of bed in terror 
woken by her mother's screams. Startled into alertness, she ran into her parents' bedroom. As soon as she entered, her mother Anna shouted frantically, Get the children out of the house! Someone tried to kill your father! It was then that she saw the figure slumped on the floor, her father covered with blood and moaning in agony. Mary didn't need to be told twice and hurriedly ushered her four younger sisters outside. As they stood in shock in the cold night air, waiting for the ambulance to arrive, Anna and Alina held her youngest child in her arms. The two boys of the family, John and Salvatore, aged 13 and 14, were taken to hospital with minor wounds, along with their father, Epifanio, who was seriously hurt. Epifanio and Anna originated from Sicily and were also grocery store owners, living in a building attached to the back of the store which they had run for five years. Anna told detectives she had woken to see a man at her husband's side holding a hatchet and a revolver. He pointed the gun at her and told her to keep quiet, then raised the hatchet and brought it down five times on her husband's head before calmly retreating from the room. It was at this point that Anna screamed, which woke Mary and her two brothers, who slept in another room. The intruder hit the teenage boys on their head with the butt of his pistol and made his getaway through the kitchen door, leaving the bloody hatchet on the floor. None of the family could describe their attacker as the rooms were lit only by the dim glow of an oil lamp. Epifanio had been asleep when he received the first blow and then tried to pull the bedclothes over his head and face to protect himself. As with the previous attacks, nothing had been stolen, but police found that a wooden panel had been chiselled out of the kitchen door. Once removed, the assailant must have reached through to unlock it from the inside. The Andalinas had no enemies and could offer police no suggestions of who could possibly have wanted them dead. They all survived, but Epifanio died just ten months later in the Spanish flu epidemic, possibly due to his weakened state following the vicious onslaught. At first the police didn't make the connection to the 1910 and 1911 attacks, as many of the officers involved in those investigations were now retired or dead. Just a few months before the brutal assault on the Andalinas, Police Chief Reynolds had been shot dead at point-blank range by one of his own patrolmen, Terence Mullen. The officers who failed to protect Reynolds were forced to take early retirement and Mullen was admitted to an asylum for life. The new police chief superintendent Frank Mooney had good intentions but his previous job overseeing the Illinois Railroad had ill-prepared him for his role in a corrupt police department in a city being terrorised by a phantom axeman. Two miles away from the Andalina home, and less than six months later, the police received a disturbing phone call which urged them to Come at once! My brother and his wife have been killed! A squad of police officers converged on the corner of Magnolia and Upperline, dreading what they would see. The sign at the front read Grocery and Bar, Joe Maggio. The police were greeted by brothers Jacob and Andrew Maggio, who looked distraught and worse for wear. The brothers ushered them into the back room, where the police captain was presented with a scene that he later stated was the most horrific he had ever borne witness to. The third of the Maggio brothers, Joe, was sprawled on the bed with his feet hanging off the side. His wife Catherine lay on her back on the floor. The faces and necks of both victims were saturated with blood, which had sprayed almost seven feet up the wall, colouring the icons of the Virgin Mary with splashes of red, an extra insult that might have amused the unholy attacker. Joe Maggio was still alive, but only just, his life was extinguished like a guttering candle flame just as the ambulance arrived, joining his wife in death. Superintendent Mooney and Chief of Detectives George Long arrived on the scene and the surviving brothers 
told them a harrowing tale. 28-year-old Andrew worked in a barber shop and lived with brother Joe and sister-in-law Catherine. That day he had received an unwelcome surprise in the mail, papers drafting him into the army. He didn't want to join, so he had completed a form to claim that his mother was solely dependent on him for his support, which wasn't entirely true. He was dreading his appointment with the exemption office the following week and had been out drinking on the night of 22nd of May 1918 to drown his sorrows. After he was thoroughly three sheets to the wind, he stumbled home and went to bed. At around 4.30am, he sat up in bed and looked around, woken by something. He was still intoxicated, but he was aware enough to know that something was wrong. There was a moaning sound coming from Joe and Catherine's room on the other side of the wall. He knocked on the wall but received no response. Too apprehensive to investigate, he got dressed and ran down the road to the home of his brother Jacob, who ran a shoe shop. When the pair returned together, they noticed that the kitchen door was hanging open at the back of the house and one of its wood panels lay on the ground. Fear clutched at their hearts. It was looking increasingly likely that the notorious Axeman had struck. Jacob and Andrew had plucked up the courage to enter Joe and Catherine's room and immediately called for the police and ambulance when their eyes lit on the carnage within. The autopsy found that Joe had been hit twice with an axe, which fractured his skull then his face and neck were cut with a razor blade. It looked like Catherine had got out of bed to come to her husband's aid and had been slashed by the killer multiple times herself on the face, neck and hand. Once again, the resourceful trespasser had gained entry through a door panel and once again, he hadn't used his own weapon. A bloody axe was found in the bathroom with human hair still attached to it, which was confirmed to belong to Joe and was usually kept in the backyard. But this time, there was one key difference. He had made off with $50 in cash. He had also rifled through drawers and flung clothes about the room, as if to convince everyone that the motive was burglary. But he had taken nothing else, including a jewellery box, which would have been worth more than the dollar bills. Police were initially suspicious of Andrew and Jacob, particularly because a razor blade had been used in the murder, and Andrew was a barber. They later found a straight razor sticking out of the rose trellis on the lawn of the house, next to the Maggio's, with dried blood on the blade. A search of Andrew's bedroom revealed three similar straight razors, but all were completely clean. A screwdriver matching the marks on the wooden door panel was also discovered in the backyard, and footprints of feet clad in stockings were seen on the bar counter. Had the prowler climbed up onto the counter to check whether there was anything valuable hidden on the top shelves? Andrew was questioned for hours, but remained adamant that he had nothing to do with the crime and the bloody razor did not belong to him. He said, How could you think I could kill my own brother? He sent us the money to come to America. He supported us after our father died. Joe was like a father to me. I know a man isn't supposed to cry, but... (laughs) The police were never able to identify where the bloody razor had come from, and Superintendent Mooney said, We conducted a rigorous examination of Andrew Maggio. The doubt of his guilt is so strong that we're compelled to give him the benefit of the doubt. Our hope for a solution is still bright. The following morning, a disturbingly cryptic message was found written in chalk on a sidewalk just a block away, which read, Mrs. Joseph Maggio is going to sit up tonight, just like Mrs. Tony. There was no evidence to confirm whether it had been written before the attack, as a warning, or afterwards as a morbid prank. Police wondered if it referred to the murder of an Italian grocer named Tony Schiambra in 1912, 
whose wife Joanna was known locally as Mrs Tony. Tony was shot dead while asleep in bed and a stray bullet had hit Joanna. Tony was killed instantly and Joanna later died in the hospital after the wound became infected. After reviewing the old files, detectives were convinced that the Skiambra murder was unrelated to the string of axe attacks. The weapon was different and the axe man seemed to crave blood. A gun was a much quicker way of killing and creates a psychological distance between the victim and the killer, while using an axe or hatchet rewards a sanguinary killer with a sensation of every blow and the pleasure of the catastrophically gory effects. Police concluded that the chalk message was most likely a red herring written by a journalist to further sensationalise the case. It was at this time that the press latched onto the idea of the killings being linked to the older murders from 1910 and 1911, attributed to the cleaver, and speculated that the perpetrator was one and the same. The case hardly needed sensationalising. It was spreading terror across the city, even without exaggeration. A criminal who was so light on his feet and with his hands that he didn't wake his victims while he was chiselling out their door panels until he was standing in their bedroom. A killer who was targeting a particular group of people, almost always Italian grocers who lived in rooms at the back of their business premises, but whom he had no clear motive to hate. None of the victims had any enemies, and it seemed unlikely to be related to organised crime, black hand or otherwise. For one thing, they would have been more likely to only kill the man of the house, rather than hurting the women and children. Even mafiosos had a conscience. The choice of weapon and the mode of entry suggested a devious mind, one who had spent a great deal of time planning their crimes. On the surface, they appeared disorganised, not even bothering to bring their own weapon and finding something to use in their victim's house or en route. But in reality, this was yet more evidence they were aware of police procedures and knew that weapons could be traced so he chose not to buy one openly or use something that could be linked back to him. Could it even have been a policeman? After all, New Orleans law enforcement was corrupt and a patrolman had killed a police chief in recent years. Detectives searched day and night for a lead in the murders of Joe and Catherine Maggio, but found nothing. Forensic science in those days was limited and psychological profiling was decades away. Detective Superintendent Frank Mooney downplayed claims that the 1910 and 11 attacks were linked to the Maggio and Andalina cases, but privately he couldn't fail to notice the grisly similarities. He had an uncanny suspicion that they hadn't seen the last of the vicious axe attacks. A month later, he was proved right. On Thursday, 26th of June, 1918, John Zanker knocked on the door of a grocery store owned by 60-year-old Louis Bessemer to deliver his daily bread order. Bessemer lived with his mistress, 28-year-old Harriet Lowe, although everyone in the neighbourhood believed they were married and knew them as Mr. and Mrs. Bessemer. Zanker was concerned when nobody answered the door. It was 7am and they should already have been open. Grocery store owners worked extremely long hours. Zanka noticed the shutters were down and the front door was bolted. He walked around to the back and tried again. Is anybody home? Come around front. My God, what's happened? Louis Bessemer's face was streaked with blood and he looked like he had aged overnight. He brushed off his injuries, assuring the delivery man that it was nothing to worry about. But Zankar asked where Mrs Bessemer was and made his way inside where he found Harriet lying on the bed surrounded by a rapidly spreading pool of blood, barely conscious. I, I'm so cold. 
Mio Dio! Mary Mother of God! You've been cut up badly. Here, there are some clothes on the floor. I'll cover you with them to keep you warm. Don't worry. I'll run and fetch a policeman. Mr. Besimir, you should lie down too. The Bessemers were taken to Charity Hospital while several officers examined the crime scene. Although clothing from the wardrobe was scattered around the room, nothing had been stolen. As with the previous attacks, the weapon was found on the scene and identified as Bessemer's own hatchet. Bloody footprints were seen leading out of the bedroom. Louis had a minor gash on his forehead, but Harriet was more seriously hurt with a cracked skull and several deep cuts to her chest and arms. There were a few interesting differences with this case. Firstly, the female victim had suffered the worst injuries, while in previous incursions the male had received the brunt of the attack. Bessemer was an Eastern European immigrant rather than an Italian. There was no evidence pointing to a method of ingress as the wood panel on the back door was intact and the doors had all been bolted when the delivery man arrived. And the attack had taken place shortly before 7am when the sun was up unlike all the previous Axeman incidents, which had occurred between 1 and 3 a.m. in less densely populated parts of New Orleans. Mooney was immediately suspicious of Bessemer and noticed that he talked too much and didn't give straight answers to his questions. Bessemer bombastically announced, I am a born investigator, Mr. Mooney. I speak 13 languages and am something of a student of crime and chemistry. I leave no stone unturned, and I believe I can help in the investigation of who did this to us. I will not rest until the matter is well and truly put to bed. An examination of his past showed that Bessemer had opened the grocery store three months earlier when he first moved to the area from Florida, and any information about his life before that was sketchy. A search of his home turned up some letters from Germany, leading to rumours that he was involved in espionage. After all, the First World War was in full swing and America had entered the conflict a year ago. The times Picayune newspaper ran with the idea and printed a headline on 29th of June which read, Hatchet Mystery May Lead to Spy Nest. As an aside, some sources state that Bessemer was Polish but I believe he was German and came from Danzig. This was disputed territory at the time, which may have led to the confusion, but the name Bessemer derives from the German word for broom maker. This could explain why he was corresponding with people in Germany. A former employee of Bessemer was briefly arrested and questioned before being released. Harriet Lowe spent some time in hospital, recovering from the physical and psychological wounds. After returning home, her health deteriorated, and on 3rd of August 1918, she requested to speak to Superintendent Mooney, and revealed that it was partner Louis Bessemer who had attacked her. On this occasion, it was a case of domestic violence rather than the ubiquitous, axe-wielding spectre that was terrorising New Orleans. After all, even the Axeman couldn't be responsible for every act of violence committed within the city's environs, could he? Louis's own wounds were likely inflicted by Harriet in self-defence. Mr Bessemer was arrested that night and Harriet died the next day. He was later convicted of murder by a jury, but whether he was really a spy as well as a killer remains unknown. Perhaps the Bessemer tragedy reminded the Axeman of his thirst for blood as he struck the very next day. Just after midnight on 5th of August 1918, a man named Ed Schneider had just finished his shift at the wharf, loading freight from cargo ships onto trains. He had three children with wife Mary and she was eight months pregnant with another. As he returned home to 1320 Elmira Street, in a suburb to the east of the city, he was alarmed to see at least 10 police officers clustered outside his house, and his sister-in-law who lived next door was in tears. 
He ran towards them in panic and begged them to tell him what had happened. It transpired that an intruder had entered the house and smashed a lamp over Mary's head and face. She was unconscious and had lost some teeth but was stable. When she woke up in the hospital, she couldn't remember anything about the attack and gave birth to a healthy baby a few weeks later. Cupboards and dresses had been rummaged through and a few dollars were stolen, but a box containing a hundred dollars was left intact. The family were neither grocers nor Italians, but their home was central among the locations of the three axe attacks that had taken place in 1910-11, which police didn't believe was a coincidence. The reason for the break-in became clearer when they searched the shed and found that an axe had been stolen. The question was, where did the axe man intend to use it? The papers gleefully conjectured about what malevolent forces drove the axe man, some theorising that he was a Jekyll and Hyde character with a split personality, normal citizen by day and maniac by night. Others speculated that he was guided by the phases of the moon as he always struck on moonless nights, although this might have been simply because he was less likely to be spotted in the dark. By now, Axeman fever had well and truly proliferated through every street and every suburb. Italian grocers were particularly fearful, but it seemed nobody was safe and even non-Italians wondered if they would be the next to wake up in the night to see a tenebrous figure slinking through their homes searching for a weapon. Gun sales increased dramatically and everyone knew someone with a story about a discarded axe being found nearby. There was one tale of a man standing guard overnight as his family slept and when he heard the telltale's chiselling sounds outside, he fired his shotgun through the door and watched in triumph as the intruder made a hasty retreat. All this talk was not helping 15-year-old Pauline Bruno get to sleep. On the night of 10th of August, at her home in 2336 Gravia Street, she was suffering from insomnia as the ghastly thoughts went round and round her head, her family were Italian grocers and she lived on the corner of Tonti and Gravia with her 13-year-old sister Mary and their 31-year-old uncle Joe Romano. Their mother Lily lived with her widowed sister Rosie across the street. Pauline worked in a candy factory while Rosie helped to run the grocery at the front of the house. Uncle Joe was a barber. They were poor but managing and sold daily staples from the grocery, such as beans, rice and cigarettes. At 3am, tossing and turning, Pauline heard a groan coming from Uncle Joe's room. She sat bolt upright in bed and watched her worst fears coming true before her eyes. There was a man standing in the doorway. She screamed, which woke Mary, and the younger girl screamed too, which made the dark figure run away. They watched in disbelief as Uncle Joe emerged from his room, clutching his head, which was dripping with blood. Something has happened. M my head hurts. Call for an ambulance. His strength depleted, he passed out in a chair. They didn't have a phone, so the girls ran to a neighbour's home and the police and ambulance were called. Mooney and his men arrived accompanied by a bevy of reporters who were feeling sick to their stomachs with an odd combination of thrill at the prospect of a scoop and trepidation at the scene they would be presented with. Fingerprints were taken from the open window and police deduced that the assailant had found some wooden boards in a neighbouring vacant lot and leaned them against the fence, using them to shimmy over into the Romano's backyard. He had then spotted the family's shed and taken an axe from it, then crawled into the open window at the back. The blood-stained axe was found on the floor next to Joe Romano's bed, which was unsurprisingly soaked with blood. The nighttime assassin then fled via the kitchen with a pair of the victim's trousers, but he dropped them on the kitchen floor and made off with Romano's wallet, 
which he had presumably found in the pocket. Young Pauline Bruno described the man as tall and heavy built, with a dark suit and a dark hat. She thought he was white, but she couldn't say for sure. She told police, He was awfully light on his feet. I think he had rubber soles. Her description was similar to the one given by Harriet Crutie back in 1910, but nobody else had got much of a look at him in the intervening attacks. Even though this case lacked the iconic door panel chiselling that was synonymous with the axe man, Mooney firmly believed it was carried out by the same man. After all, he'd proven that he was happy to take advantage of windows if the householder had left them open to make it easy for him. He would only bother with the chisel if he had to. The area around Tonti and Gravier was more densely populated than the scenes of his initial attacks, but he may have been driven to riskier hunting grounds due to the increased police presence elsewhere. Joe Romano died in hospital and this time reports of the murder led to full-scale panic. People resorted to putting bars on their windows, and an assortment of escapades and failed attempts came to light. Joseph LeBeuf had chased away an intruder who tried to break in through his back door in the middle of the night, while a few blocks away, another grocer had driven off a suspicious-looking man who discarded an axe in the yard. Others reported finding chisel marks on their back doors, One grocer on Robertson Street was saved by a crate of tomatoes blocking his door, which the interloper couldn't move without making too much noise. On the night after the Romano murder, a burglar tried breaking into a nearby saloon and was partway through removing the door panel when he was interrupted, so he dropped his tools and disappeared into the night. The next morning, the saloon owner woke to find a screwdriver, an axe, and a 38 calibre cartridge outside his door. A collection of chilling signs that he had nearly had a close brush with death. Nobody knew if all these reports were as the result of the axe man himself or copycats. The residents of New Orleans were saved from brutality for the rest of 1918 by an unexpected and even more unwelcome newcomer, Spanish Flu. The worldwide outbreak effectively closed down whole cities, with social clubs, dance halls and theatres forced to close. As a result, talk of the Axeman died down as the papers were filled with bad news of the epidemic, and good news about the end of the war in November. It wasn't until March of the following year that Orleanians were reminded that the Axeman hadn't ever gone away. He still walked among them. 67-year-old Yolando Giordano and his 52-year-old wife Lily ran a grocery store in Gretna. Both were struggling with their age and health as years of running the store seven days a week had taken its toll. Their 18-year-old daughter Lena was now doing the lion's share of the work and was getting sick of it, so she decided to get a job in a local factory instead. Though Giordano's 17-year-old son Frank had little interest in the store either as he dreamed of setting up a real estate business. He had an outgoing personality and was a good salesman, so he was well suited to that line of work. He planned to marry his girlfriend Josie on 19th of March, which was St Joseph's Day, a religious festival that Italian families traditionally celebrated. Because of Lena and Frank's desire for a different life from their parents, the Giordanos decided to lease the grocery store to their neighbours, the Cortemilias. 25-year-old Charlie Cortemilia and his 20-year-old wife Rosie had a two-year-old daughter named Mary, who Frank Giordano often babysat. They all got on well, until in December 1918, Yolando Giordano decided to take back control of the store and gave the court Amelia's notice. Lena had lost her job at the factory and wanted to run the store again, and Yolando felt he should give it to his son Frank to help him and his future children. 
This caused tension between the two families and Charlie and Rosie felt so betrayed that they opened their own rival grocery store nearby. But their new store was only open for a couple of weeks before disaster struck. At 10pm on Saturday 8th of March 1919, Frank Giordano went into his parents' bedroom to tell them about a bad dream his fiancée Josie had had. He wanted to know if the dream meant something, or if it was just anxiety about the upcoming wedding which was just 11 days away. An hour later, at about 11pm, Yolando Giordano was woken by the sound of barking dogs. He made his way outside to check that nobody was trying to steal his chickens, but found nothing. In the early hours of Sunday morning, someone crept into the Court Amelia's yard, found an axe, and began carefully tap-tap-tapping with a screwdriver to remove a panel from the kitchen door. Then he reached his arm inside and unlocked the bolt. He removed his boots and walked through the now open door in his stockinged feet. The house was still silent. Nobody inside had heard anything. He entered the bedroom of Charlie and Rosie caught Amelia, who were fast asleep with their two-year-old daughter between them. He raised his axe and brought it down on them over and over until the bedclothes were a river of blood. He left the axe on the back porch and disappeared, taking nothing from the house. The sound of dogs barking again woke some of the neighbours who rushed over to the Court Amelia home. Frank Giordano was one of the first on the scene. The back door was open and inside in the bedroom, Charlie Court Amelia was gasping for breath and begging for help. Frank ran to get a doctor, unable to bring himself to look at the unnaturally still form of young Mary. Charlie and Rosie had fractured skulls and devastating blood loss, but miraculously survived. Two-year-old Mary, however, was declared dead. The hysteria grew and the case took a distasteful and unsettling turn when a ghoulish handwritten letter arrived at the office of the Times Picayune the following week, dated March 13th, 1919, from hell. They have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. <laughs> I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your... <laughs> Foolish police, call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. <laughs> I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. <laughs> if you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact... They have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, <laughs> Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware and let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. Oh, I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. 
Undoubtedly, you Orlanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am. But I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay you a visit to your city every night. <laughs> At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now, to be exact, at 1225, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans in my infinite mercy. I am going to make a little proposition to your people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at that time I have just mentioned. If, if everyone has a jazz band going, well, then so much better for you people. Oh, one thing is certain, and that is some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Ah, well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home. I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact of realm. <laughs> oh, or realm of fancy. This macabre missive was signed the Axeman. It was impossible not to notice the echoes of the infamous letter sent to the police in Whitechapel in 1888 addressed from hell and purporting to be from Jack the Ripper. It's likely the Axeman letter was written by someone well-educated, like a journalist, who had relished creating such a dramatic missive which exuded an air of impudent superiority. Tartarus refers to dungeon-like underworlds where evil people were kept in Greek mythology, and the mention of Francis Joseph probably refers to the Emperor of Austria Franz Josef, who declared war on Serbia in 1914 after his nephew Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by Gavrilo Princip. Coincidentally, Princip was a member of the Serbian nationalist group known as the Black Hand, although this has nothing to do with the mafia-style Black Hand. The other person suspected of being the prankster penman was vaudeville performer Joseph de Villa, who cashed in on the situation by composing a piece of music called The Mysterious Axeman's Jazz, Don't Scare Me Papa, which flew off the shelves. New Orleans is viewed as the birthplace of jazz with its own unique sound, from the earliest Dixieland style studded with African influences through to street corner brass bands so perhaps it should come as no surprise that the city's most famous serial killer had somehow become inextricably linked with jazz music. Whether Orleanians took the threat seriously, or whether it was just an excuse to party, jazz clubs were packed all night on Tuesday 18th of March. The sound of soulful trumpets and syncopating rhythms drifting out from every building, until exactly... 12.25 a.m., as the Axeman's letter demanded. Intriguingly, there were no attacks that night as promised. It was a quiet summer on the Axeman front, with no further high-profile attacks, although in the meantime police decided they had a suspect in the Cortemelia case. In fact, they had two. 
Yolando Giordano and his son Frank. When Charlie and Rosie had first woken up in hospital to the dreadful news that their daughter had not survived, Charlie told police through his overwhelming grief that the man who attacked them was white and had been large. Rosie could not remember anything and doctors told the police to go easy on questioning her as she had suffered severe head injuries and was pumped full of painkillers. They ignored the doctor's advice and hectored Rosie for days with leading questions which further confused her already fragile mind, particularly as English was not her first language. Eventually the police got what they wanted and Rosie pointed the finger at her neighbours and competitors, the Giordanos. After all, they had a clear motive as everyone in the area knew that there was bad blood between the families over the store lease. Police posited that Frank had chiselled out the panel on the kitchen door but could not fit his arm through the hole to reach up and draw the bolt back due to his 6 foot 3, 270 pound frame so he asked his arthritic father to help. Despite the absurdity of this and the fact that Rosie had only changed her mind and named the Giordanos as the attackers after police badgering, Frank and Orlando were arrested. When Rosie was discharged from Charity Hospital, she was put through an unconscionable ordeal of being locked in a cell by a sheriff on the grounds that she was a material witness. The sheriff and the DA interrogated her and encouraged her to sign a statement to confirm her accusation of the Giordanos, even though she couldn't read or write English, and she had been denied the chance to have legal counsel present. Once the injured and bereaved woman signed the statement, they released her. The trial began on Monday 19th of May 1919 when Frank and Josie should have been celebrating the two month anniversary of a wedding they'd had to postpone indefinitely. The case was built on Rosie Cortemilia's statement and the family's disagreement over the grocery store. The defence reminded the jury that Rosie's head injuries could make her more likely to be paranoid and suggestible and the doctor recalled that at no point did Rosie ever tell him that she knew who hurt her, because she didn't know, until the police planted the idea in her head. Superintendent Mooney was called to the stand and stated that the axeman could well be responsible, but the judge decided it was irrelevant and told the jury not to let the axeman attacks influence their decision. After less than two hours of deliberation, the Giordanos were found guilty. Elderly Orlando was sentenced to life in prison while Frank was to receive the death penalty. On 3rd of August 1919, the real Axeman returned. 19-year-old Sarah Lauman was attacked in her bed one night and suffered minor head injuries. She described her attacker as around 5 foot 8 with dark clothing and a dark complexion and the family's axe was missing from their shed and later found abandoned down the street. A week later, Italian grocer Steve Boker had his head cracked open by an assailant who had gained entry by removing a door panel and left behind a bloody axe on the kitchen floor. However, there is some debate among modern scholars over whether Boker really existed. Finally, just before Halloween of 1919, the final outrage took place. At around 1am, Esther Pepitoni, the wife of Italian grocer Michael Pepitoni, woke up to see that her husband had been smashed over the head with a metal pipe as he slept. He died two hours later in hospital. But this time police felt it was a result of a personal vendetta rather than the work of the Axeman. And interestingly, Esther reported seeing two figures running from the bedroom, not one. Even so, the media attributed the Pepitoni murder to the Axeman. But this was the last time they would be able to use the New Orleans serial door chiselling, hatchet wielding murderer to sell papers. He melted away into the city side streets as suddenly as he had arrived and never struck again. 
Superintendent Mooney handed in his badge and returned to the private sector, glad to see the back of his short-lived police career. Rosie caught Amelia, recanted her statement about the Giordanos, and Frank and Yolando were acquitted and released. Despite having spent many months in custody with the shadow of the noose haunting their dreams, they bore no resentment to the court Amelias and were simply happy to be free men. There was one more intriguing coda to the story still to come. In Los Angeles in late 1921, a woman named Esther Albano shot dead a man named Joseph Mumphrey who'd been blackmailing her family and whom she suspected of murdering her husband. Esther had lost two husbands to murder in as many years. She had previously lived in New Orleans and was the wife of Michael Pepitoni. Mumphrey was a scoundrel well known for his violence and extortion schemes and there would have been a few to shed a tear at his passing. It seems likely that he was involved in Pepitoni's murder but many argue that Mumphrey was the Axeman himself. But he had been in prison at the time of many of the attacks and had already left for Los Angeles prior to the attack on the court Amelia's. The Axeman's bloodthirsty methods were also at odds with Mumphrey's own gangland style. The story of the Axeman is a unique one, which leaves many unanswered questions resounding in our minds like the final dying notes of a haunting piece of music. Why did the killer target Italian grocers and how did he manage to chisel out door panels without waking anyone? How did he know the layout of their stores and locate his victims in the dark? And why did he stop? Maybe he was arrested for some other crime, or maybe he fell ill and died. What we do know is that he left at least five bodies in his wake and affected the lives of many more. To this day, nobody knows his true identity. When we think of murder, the human mind is so often drawn to the image of shadowy streets in the dead of night, in a place full of silent menace. This is why it can feel so incongruous that such atrocities could be committed in a city known for its liveliness and colour, for its eclectic mix of cultures and for its music and festivals. The Mardi Gras Shrove Tuesday parades are famous across the world and for a few days New Orleans is fit to burst with garish floats and people dressed in masks and disguises that range from the amusing to the macabre to the downright grotesque. Flaming torches, flashing lights, bright beads and trinkets and the strains of brass, rhythm and blues epitomise the famous carnival. But even amongst the revelry, colour and noise, there lurks the occasional reminder of the city's bloody past. Perhaps someone dressed in an ill-chosen costume to represent the Axeman. Who knows, maybe even now, the ghost of the Axeman drifts through the city of mystery's historic streets, pausing at the doorway to each bar and club to listen to the music coming from inside ready to fulfil his promise of killing again if they're not playing his favourite jazz. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prash's Murder Map. The podcast is 100% independent and is researched, written and produced by myself and my wife. Please subscribe and leave me a review wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can support me on Patreon, make a one-off donation via PayPal, or buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com. You can find all the links in the show notes. I really appreciate your support, and I'll see you again soon.